If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this super duper awesome episode of Mind Pump. Pump, the super mm. duperist. So look, for 50 minutes, uh, we do our fun time conversation. Before we get into the fitness stuff, here's what we talked about. We talked about Justin's bad eyesight. He's an old guy now. Damn it. And how he's going to get the Felix Gray prescription blue blocking glasses. That's right. They make those Slow two. down. Uh, now, we do work with Felix Gray. They are one of our sponsors. If you go to Felix Gray glasses, Gray is spelled G-R-A-Y, uh, dot com forward slash mind pump. You'll get free shipping and free returns. Uh, then Adam talks about how he stepped on his glasses. What a klutz. Yeah. I talked about my laser eye surgery. It sounded like I was going to be a superhero. Laser. I got laser eyes. Then we talked about our call with Ned. Now, they are the makers of the best quality full spectrum hemp oil on the market. People love using this for things like anti-anxiety, relaxing sleep, anti-inflammatory, great stuff. Uh, we have a discount for you. If you go to helloned, H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash mind pump, you'll get 15% off your first purchase. Then we talked again about the Noxima girl. Uh, she had a sex tape back in 2009. Oh, very interesting. Apparently you can find it online if you look it up. Uh, Adam brought up the new season of Billions on Showtime. Oh, so good. Talked about The Wire. And then I brought up Waco on Amazon Prime. That shit's crazy. Yeah, you really crapped us out with that Spoiler one. Spoiler alert, by the way, if you don't know your history, uh, don't listen to this episode on that part there. We'll give away the spoiler a bit. Uh, then we talked about a study on the DNA switch that Harvard uh, researchers found that can turn on whole body regeneration. That's right. You can grow new limbs, Justin. Sweet, finally. Uh, then we talked about our St. Patrick's Day weekend. And then we called our friend Max Lugavere and asked him his opinion on this study that's uh, circulating that talks about how eating eggs increases your risk of mortality. Mm. Then we get into the fitness question. First question was, what are the misconceptions about training men and women and the differences between training men and women? There's a lot of marketing out there that says, this workout's for women, this diet's for men. Uh, should you listen to them or is it just clever marketing? Mm -hmm. Next question uh, if you have a weaker side, uh, how do you bring it up to match the stronger side? How do you balance your body out? We give some strategies in that part of this episode. Next question, once you've gotten to your fitness goals, what do I do to maintain my fitness? How do I keep myself where I'm at? I don't want to improve anymore. I don't want to look any more awesome. Uh, kind of sounds awesome to be you, whatever. Mm, give yourself uh, a high five. So we give the best workout that you can do to not change in that part of this episode. <laughs> And the final question, yeah. what are the most important things you need to do uh, to be in a successful online coach and trainer? Also, this month, MAPS Aesthetic. This is the body sculpting, bodybuilding, physique competitor, bikini competitor program. It's a lot of volume, hard workouts, okay? So just putting it out there, hard workouts. Yeah, That program's 50% off. It's half off. All you got to do is go to MAPS Fitness Products. Dot com and use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0. Also, we have other programs on that site, and we have bundles. For example, we have something called a Super Bundle, which is a full year of workouts and exercise programming all planned out for you. You can find all of that at mapsfitnessproducts.com. T-shirt time! And it's T-shirt time! Oh, shit. You guys know I love this time of the week. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our winners from Sweet. iTunes are Brittany Butler, Stronger Every Day, O T K G J S H S U D H, the Froggy Viking. And on Facebook, we have Heather oh, Kosha and Jesse Aslan. Except for Justin and I had a kid. Yeah. <laughs> the <Froggy laughs> is, dude. All of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Send your shirt size, your shipping address, include your Instagram handle, and we'll get that shirt right out to you. Yeah. You and I were talking the other day, and we were talking about your uh, getting prescription glasses, and I suggested to you, why don't you just go through the Felix Gray? And I don't think you even thought of that. No, I didn't even think of that. I mean, I have both of their glasses right now uh, for nighttime and during the day, and it's funny because... 
I've been I, I love using it during the day for uh, the computer, but I switch I was switching them off and on because I was like, oh, I was still getting a little bit of a headache because obviously I need glasses, right? And so I went through this whole process of like testing them again, and uh, it, it's depressing. It's like a little bit worse this time. So. so what's your vision? Do you know what they said? I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember. That. So are you need? Do you need it to drive? I I do I, I do need it to drive yeah so I'm starting to wear them as I drive and then also every time that I'm like reading something on the computer like I have to have them on yeah the 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 eyesight that you know how you focus on things close to you the the muscles that help you do that start to lose their uh, I guess their elasticity or whatever mm -hmm. so you're gonna have to be you're gonna wear bifocals at one point because <laughs> you can't see far away can't see close you could do the laser eye surgery that's how expensive no it? three I, grand. It's no, I'd rather. I got yeah. it. You have it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know you wore yeah, glasses. Yeah, I did. The, I did dude, I had. Um, I had to work. work you, I had to work. You're glasses. cool, like just looking right into lasers. Like, is that <laughs> how it goes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's not yeah. like that. No, it's worse. That's how I imagine it. No, I, so I did it. I did it. Let's see. I probably got my eyes done 13 years ago. Back when they first, <laughs> wow! Before they even proved yeah, that was risky. I, I know <laughs> that is that is risky. Yeah, no, I, you know I what they do. I stepped on my Felix craze last night. No, yeah, I did. I stepped on them. Are they broken? No, they. I bent the shit out of them, and it was all frustrated and pissed. And then I thought I was. I thought they were going to be done for. I'm like, well, I already bent them like crazy. Let's see if I can kind of bend them back. And I actually bent them right back. Can't even tell. Oh wow, they're pretty durable. Huh? Yeah, no, they're really durable. I don't recommend people step on their Felix Grays, yeah. but I mean, I they had they were in my lap, so I was watching TV, and I don't know what I took them off for, and I, I set them in my lap, and then I I got up to go get something, mm -hmm. and it must have fell off on the floor, and then when I came back, and I felt crunch. Yeah, and I was like, oh. So they don't they don't break. No. You think if Justin stepped on them, they wouldn't break? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm That's pretty the good test about right not there. Breaking no, fast, so. I mean they're 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 a lot more durable than I would have expected. So shout out to Felix Gray for making some glasses well, you I, could I, step on. I couldn't find my night <laughs> yeah. Felix Gray ones, uh, so I had to use my old school, you know, blue blockers, the orange ones. Yeah. Fucking hate them. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. You know, you yeah. Once you go, yeah, once you it's... once you get away from those, it's hard to go back to those. Well, ones. Well, because though. you watch TV or whatever, yeah, it ruins everything. And the whole TV's everything's orange. Yeah, it changes all the colors. You look like a dork. I was watching a, a documentary on That's nature. That's the biggest thing. You yeah. look like a fucking dork. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, if you're at yeah. home, because, I don't know. But I, and I don't care about. But I'm watching a, a nature TV show, and one of the wonderful things about watching nature, you know, documentaries, the vibrant colors and stuff. Yeah, especially you know, 4K yeah. or whatever. You're like, whoa! But you put on the, the orange glasses and you're like okay <laughs> yeah. okay i see two yeah. colors doesn't look yeah. that great anyway no but no i got my la i got laser eye surgery uh 13 years ago and you want to know what the process is like it's actually not that bad no tell me because it yeah i just seriously i i, I imagine like it's like the cyclops it hurts for like a day doesn't it like 24 days 24 it, hours it wasn't bad at all you want to itch your eyeballs i kept thinking of Ugh. uh what's that one was it a clockwork or orange where they where they have the guy's eyes open and <laughs> they're making them they're forcing them to watch it yeah that's what i was worried about Ugh. no i you i went in there and they they have you fill everything out and then they say hey do you would you like a, a Valium and I'm like I'm not nervous but sure I'll take a Valium <laughs> so I took a yeah you gonna offer me you know I mean for free yeah so I'll it? do it okay. cool so you go in and they put eye drops in your eyes and then this thing holds your eye open and the procedure's literally a minute that's it it's wow. like a minute long but you see the because it holds your eye open and you're just laying there you see the thing peel back ooh. You're the, the part of your eye. So all of no. a sudden they peel it back and everything's super cloudy. And you're like, oh shit, Ew. like I'm blind. Wow. And then the, the laser goes bzz, 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 around your eye or whatever. And then they pull, peel it right back. And instantly. That's amazing. We instantly can you can see now. better. Who the hell figured that out? It's amazing we can do that. Do you know what I mean? Who's the first person to do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, you know, like, I think this is going to do something. Yeah. <laughs> Like, no, and uh, in, instantly when you come out of it, uh, you you could I mean you see everything with a little halo. You know when you go swimming too long in a pool. Yeah, you see that for like a day, or like a a day or two. Hmm. But I went home, took a nap, opened my eyes, and I remember for the first time I was looking at a tree outside. Mm -hmm. And up until this point, trees just looked like you know a green kind of like, mass like or whatever, mass, like little blob. All of a sudden, I could see all the leaves. I was like, oh shit! Now it's a happy tree. Yeah, and then I looked at people in their faces, and I was like, everybody's got pimples. I remember. I, I, <laughs> 
<laughs> it's like going like four or five K or whatever. Dude, it yeah. was. It was everybody had like a Valencia filter. Yeah. Bro, I was seeing everybody in Photoshop. <laughs> that, that's that's so just good. like when the actors like they got all pissed because like everything went high def. Yeah, all of a sudden yeah. it's like before that they could do the uh, the filtering, like the makeup and all that. You didn't see all like, I remember, the cakes of makeup. You you know it's funny. I I remember the transition of you know four no, before four K, but when high def first came out, ten eighty p. And whatever. you know being a big sports guy, I'd be watching like, and that's where I noticed the most is the men's make. You could see the men's makeup line because the high def was so. And so I bet there was like this. I don't know, probably a six month to a year <laughs> process of like. <laughs> Where they probably had to start doing the makeup different because I'm all sure all the way down oh, yeah. the neck. Yeah, they probably and, had to go all the way down to the shirt. Right, you know, or mm-hmm. even just like lightening up on it because it's like, hey, you know, it's yeah. TV has become so clear now. You can see, you can yeah, clearly you see, see all the makeup on it. Well, that's how it was for me. I used to see people and their faces look kind of nice and smooth, like you photoshopped it. And then I got the eye surgery, and all of a sudden, everybody's face was <laughs> wrinkled <laughs> and pimply. Yeah. yeah, I was like, holy shit, the whole world looks worse. Like, damn, it yeah, was so much worse. more attractive anyway. before, or more beautiful, or yeah. more beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Look at it. Anyway, dude, dude. I, I really, really, really enjoyed that call we had with uh, with Ned uh, the other day. I like those guys. I, you know what I like about them? They're not full of shit. They yeah. are. These guys are doing it um, the right way. Like we were on the phone with, and I want to tell the audience this because you are seeing a massive influx of hemp oil and CBD type uh, products mm-hmm. in the market. Most of which are bogus uh, because real CBD is expensive, mm-hmm. um, and so most of it's just it's garbage. But these guys know their shit, and they're talking about all the benefits of the other cannabinoids, which I really appreciated. Mm-hmm. The terpenes, uh, which are also the things that give uh, you know hemp its aromatic properties. Those things also have health benefits. Well, uh, what was body. enlightening to me too is the extraction process. Like I, uh, and I know uh, Adams talked about this on some level as far as like using butane and all these like is the common way to be able to do it cheaply. Well, that this blew me away actually. Um, where I like I had questioned him when he said it because I had never heard this. So when I was when I was in the space and we were part of the. Uh, the beginning of like the 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 wax and the shatter and the clear and all this stuff that's now evolved, and you know we you used to blow with butane. Everybody did because it was easy. You know you could go down to Home Depot, you can make a, a an at home kit and tube. You get a coffee filter, uh, get your shake and shit, and and throw it in there. And now you say blow with butane. What do you mean by that? Is it so just- you make a you make like this? You ever seen like a, a potato gun? Mm-hmm. You know the, the homemade one. I made like, a few of those. Yeah, yeah like at a at a. Have like, you really? Fuck yeah! yeah. I those have, things are real I have too. Those are oh. a real deal. And so you Love you those. you you take like you know CO2 cartridges. You take a PVC pipe that's about you know about yay long. So I'm about I don't know what's that four feet or so, maybe three and a half four feet long. And then you you wrap a we do a um, coffee filter on one end, and then you stuff it with. Uh, all your trim and shake and then you and you have a cap on it that has just a tiny hole where the the butane goes in and you blast the butane through it and the butane goes through it and then it kind of it freezes all the trichomes and and crystals and everything off of off of it and then it drips through the filter Hmm. and so what drips through the filter is the wax it gets all that's it concentrates it it, it falls off but then it melts again and then it's not that it it, like it freezes it off and liquefies it so it liquid so when you the the um, butane is so freezing cold that it it drips the you know i can't fuck i don't know what the the science fucking word i'm i'm trying to <laughs> i'm searching for here right uh, science word where are you the science yeah, fucking yeah. word yeah, yeah. yeah. so just it, make one up dude right so it blows it yeah right i'll just make something it, it blows it off and and then it, it tickles you, it off it dri- drips <laughs> it, it, dri- it, it drips um Gucci, Gucci. it drips through the filter and then you know then you let it uh, harden and then you heat it back up and then you whip the gases out of it and that's what it, i was say what do you, how do you get the butane out of it you i mean what you do is i think it's like i can't remember the the exact temperature but we f- we found the exact temperature that these gases are that burn off but then you don't want to get it so hot that it actually melts and uh, melts right. the wax so there's like a perfect temperature you keep it on i think it's like around 108 or some shit i can't remember what it was so there's so, but, but the, it, so is it safe to say that there's always a little bit always, of always always yeah. so it's impossible it's impossible to whip it all the way out so at 90 i would say 95 well back when i was doing it ever 100 percent. there was no 90 we 
In fact, we were some of the first people that started to to look into and re- and I say first people in in California and in my area. So I don't know if there's some fucking kid out in Timbuktu that was doing this yet, but which is by the way a real place. I know, I love that Timbuktu is a <laughs> I, real place. I, I didn't know that until like a couple <laughs> years you know ago. No, yeah. I didn't know it's, that. Yeah. It's T I M B U K T U or something like Timbuktu. Is is uh, bumfuck Egypt a place yeah. too? Nope, that's oh, not. Uh, nope, BFE. Oh, that's depressing. Yeah, nope. BFE was a better Maybe. one. Yeah. No, t- so anyway, uh, so anyways, uh, back then, um, that was kind of like how you how you made this, and and everybody pretty much did it this way. And then we find out that you know you're getting all this butane in, and then you started getting clubs that were saying, hey, like. You know, we've heard that this has got this in it and that's not safe. And we're like, well, yeah, that's how everybody does it. And so then we started doing research on like, how else could we do this? Well, CO2 became like the the elite way to do it. Now, it was really expensive to get a CO2 machine to actually do this. So, you know, and at, so at first we couldn't even afford to do it. We had to wait till we had made enough money to where we could afford these things. But it was known as like, that was a big deal. That was a huge selling point when you could go to clubs later on and say, Hey, ours is blown with CO2, which is the cleanest, purest form of that. So when he brought up the food grade ethanol, I had never heard of that. And that that was unheard of. And I didn't know anybody that was doing that. So the fact. I mean, it's good because the product that you use, how they extract the the cannabinoids, how they extract all the, you know, the oil or whatever. It's important because some of that's in there. Yeah, it's going to find its way in the oil. Yeah, so. It, exactly. Not, so imagine consuming and if butane. You, if you actually right. look up like what butane does inside the body, like it doesn't get rid of no. it. It doesn't get rid of it, and it, you're like, it's it'll forever be drinking gasoline. Oh, it's so bad. That's why when this whole dabbing culture took off, and I knew that's how all this stuff was being blown. And by the way, just because your shit was told, some some fucking stoner kid behind the counter told you that this stuff has been done pure and clean, Uh uh-uh. It's not regulated. It's not regulated, and it's so much cheaper to blow with butane. So you know how many people say it's not blowing with butane, but it really is blowing with butane? All right. of them. Yeah, because yeah. how are you? All gonna, of them. How are, how's the average consumer going to know? <laughs> and how is the, even the club? The club's not going back and no. uh, checking that bullshit. No. So no. now I know like there's now more processes that are happening where you you take it and you get it tested and yada yada. So it's more competitive now too. Yeah. But I mean you're I mean you're burning that off too with a, a blowtorch. Like that's just such no, a no. And the, the the way that they explained it, the reason why they use the food grade ethanol is uh, is it's a better extraction process and it keeps it it keeps the extract as close as possible to its natural form so well, it's not only a, it's not adulterated only, the, the least that way not only that but what i when I, we were talking to ned what i was so impressed by was uh, somebody who you know you're in the business of trying to make money right i get it and the process that they're doing is not only is it more expensive but it's also way more time consuming I mean, we could blow this stuff out with butane in a pipe. We could have it ready to go by tomorrow, where their, their process takes like eight days just to get a batch through, which, mm-hmm. you know, time is money in business. So for them to do things like that, I mean, I just appreciate I appreciate the partnership. And, and, you know, I'm glad you did the homework and research when we first uh, met with them, because I know I was very skeptical because well, of- quality matters, because think about it this way. Let's say you're taking, um, you know, hemp oil because of its enzyolytic properties. Let's say you like it because it helps relax you and your anxious individual, which is why a lot of people, the messages I'm getting, that's why a lot of people use it. But now let's imagine you're using this hemp oil that's you know blown through butane or whatever. And so you're consuming these small amounts of butane over the course of months and months. Next thing you know, anxiety's worse. Mm-hmm. You know, Now I feel like shit, what's going on? I'm going to blame the hemp oil or the cannabinoids. When in reality, it's because you have shit product you have something that's not made very well yeah, yeah quality makes a big difference you know so and it's not cheap that's the thing quality yeah. is expensive no nope. anyway so remember we talked about um was it last week uh the noxima girl yeah 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 so so <laughs> it's just did so you, yeah, did, you get people mess- did you get people messaging you so yeah people were messaging me like oh yeah i fucking we loved her everybody she thought she was so hot and then somebody sent me uh, uh an article that so her name is Rebecca Gayhart. Forgot all about. I didn't even know her name. I just knew her as the, the Nagzima girl. Apparently, she was in a threesome sex tape that what? came out. Yeah, wow. came, that came out about ten years ago. Wow. Yeah, you know who she was with? That guy Eric Dane. You know who that is? He's like a he's that good looking actor dude. You'll recognize him as soon as I show you a picture. He looks kind of like Leonardo DiCaprio a little yeah. bit. So her, that guy, and some other girl had uh, sex, 
and uh, videotaped and it. And apparently, it. And, and apparently, it went that out was there. like ten years. When was Paris Hilton's? Because Paris Hilton was like the first person that the sex tape thing started happening, right? That's a good question. Yeah, when, when was that? So Paris Hilton, and I think so. Wasn't there rumors too around like after that happened, how how much more famous that she became? Two thousand four. So it was when Paris Hilton did? Yeah. Right. So 2004. That was, so Paris Hilton was first, right? So uh, for, she was the first, like. One night in Paris. And not the first <laughs> person to make a Paris. sex tape, but the Brilliant first person. Title. First person that ever got, that was a celebrity where it got released and turned into a massive thing. Yeah. Then I heard that a lot of these these celebrities were doing yeah. that. Stage them. Stage them. What was the uh, other girl? Was she like a crest, you know, toothpaste commercial girl or what? No, I don't even know who the other girl was. Mm. That's a good question. Yeah, it'd be kind of, you know, like, yeah. this guy's like, yeah, I love these commercials. Tra- it, it doesn't say. I got I to gotta find out. Double mint gum. There was, I didn't watch the video. There was, so there was no a idea. hot pair of twins that were in the double mint. The double mint. Yeah, yeah go t- that route, buddy. Yeah. You want to do the that threesome. Was, that was the, yeah, that was the one that I, I thought you were, when you were trying to, Old commercials of hot chicks. That was the first that came to mind when with the, with the twins and <laughs> double, double your pleasure with your double mint gum. Yeah, those and gum commercials come. sounded <laughs> they sounded terrible. Like what was the one? Uh, uh, what's the yellow pack? Juicy that, fruit. Juicy fruit. Yeah. Juicy fruit is gonna yeah. move ya. Yeah. What did they say? Put it, in, pop it in your mouth. Right too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. It and had then it. you pop it in your mouth. Yeah, it's like <laughs> it, the whole song was like, oh. Yeah, it was <laughs> very. What the fuck are you guys talking su- about? It was very suggestive. A little bit. It yeah. was a little bit. Oh, uh, you know what? You know what I watched last night, dude. I am convinced that. Billions is the best show on TV right now. Oh, I'm so jealous. You got episode one in, huh? Yeah, so it's uh, Sunday nights, uh, Showtime. If you don't have Showtime, you can stream it uh, for like 10 bucks. Dude, a that's month. been one of my favorite shows uh, I've seen on TV. Bro, it's, you know, around, and here's the thing, like any, any TV series, uh, when you start getting beyond three seasons, I feel like most writers can write like a, a really good three season show. Mm-hmm. When you start getting to four and five, and you get beyond that, like it really starts to lose its luster to me. Like it just, it's hard, it's hard to keep up that long of a storyline that's intriguing. That's not like redundant, where it's yeah. just like okay, it's the yeah. same shit, just yeah. different. Well, especially you know? after yeah, the uh, the uh, the characters don't have that much depth to them, right? Yeah, so it's like, but this show, like they oh. did a good job of like, man, it's just so much depth each one of the characters are so like crazy like amounts of like backstory for such them. a cool fucking show man so it's season four and you know the f- episode one comes out i'm just like so fucking good what's, I can't interesting, wait. Yeah, what, what's interesting about the way that they're making these shows now is they're making them knowing that people will watch the episodes back to back so you don't have to necessarily you could tell the story much more in depth and not have to do the recap. Yeah, not have to, uh, the recap every time is annoying. Yeah, because you know before you have to wait a week or whatever. Although that's what so that's that's how they are doing it. You have to wait. Like so th- that's what's unique about. So they're not releasing them all at once. No. But so what about the old seasons? Well, yeah, you could go watch okay. old. You could watch the old season. I, I I do find that kind of interesting. Like the strategy from uh, why Showtime and HBO do this. You know, Netflix. That's something that Netflix has figured out, right? What to your point, Sal, is that you know they know that people binge watch it, so instead of just yeah, releasing, just put it all out there. Yeah, and, and so it's interesting to see uh, HBO. Do you think it's because maybe HBO and Showtime are like, okay, someone's just gonna pay for the month, watch this whole season all at once, and cancel? Well, you would think it would be for advertising purposes. That's what you would assume, but it's not that. You know, because you would think that the you the the whole idea of one episode per week and have people coming back is that you, you're drawing them to that channel. If they keep coming back, this way they can't just binge it forward through any sort of commercials or whatever. But HBO and Showtime don't do commercials. Yeah. So, you know, when I sit down and I watch the one hour of billions it's straight billions and then i shut it off and i'm not watching anything so what is the purpose of having me keep coming back Mm. to the channel every week why is that more beneficial i'm not sure yeah that's interesting i wonder if it's just old uh way of doing things haven't changed yet you know they're i mean they're they're putting out this type of content first and then netflix was trying to do the same but they again they allowed you to watch the entire season that's really what when you think about it that's netflix is really uh just like a newer version of HBO Showtime. Like that's, they were the first ones to really put money into creative like series and shit like that. And documentaries. Yeah. You remember that. when all that stuff first came out, man? Yep. I, I started to watch Wire again. This is the fourth time I've watched that, that show. And I forget how much I like that. I, uh, Katrina and I were turning her uh, nephew onto watching that. And it's such a, you know, they did this thing on one of those shows where they, they talk about, um, uh, shows that really changed the landscape of television and that were like during times that were it was very taboo. 
and now that I'm rewatching it, I'm realizing that now because it, you know, this they have a character in there that was like this gangster guy, but he was like super like gay and aggressively, like aggressively, like you just had a different character that you would never back then. First of all, it was already taboo still. We were still in this weird phase of not everybody realizing there's fucking tons of fucking gay people in this world. Mm -hmm. So that they, they, you still had that kind of going on in our mm -hmm. culture. And then and then you cast a character who's like this badass fucking gangster. And he's like openly gay, you know, making out with his partner and shit in front of like all these other gangsters. And you're yeah. like, it just blew people's like, mind. Like, huh? it's possible <laughs> you could be a gangster and you could be it just. Yeah. But you yeah. see that. And, you know, then they talk about, you know, they're showing like a lot of talk around AIDS and stuff. So they were doing a lot of things on that show. When did that show first come out? Oh, my God. This was. Uh, I don't know. Maybe Doug can Google when The Wire was, but it was it was or they were the first ones to do this. And mm -hmm. they they talked about that, like how how groundbreaking that was. I remember the show got pulled off of air after the first season because of the shit that they were showing in there. I know part of that was because they were showing basically how drug dealers can get away from being prosecuted by 2002 the that's that old yeah wow. it's real old oh wow it's so good wow yeah. i watched more of uh waco oh you oh man you gotta finish that i know Bro, i gotta finish too I've, just, I've been watching it too we're watching it last night and jessica's like they can't do that they can't do that and i'm like they did yeah this do is that. what happened this is the recap i mean they they, they they the fbi or the atf and the fbi literally went in there to fucking kill people yeah uh, they weren't uh, they no weren't even trying motives. no they weren't even trying to like let's settle this let's just start shooting and start blasting things and it's it's crazy it's a crazy story it's crazy the story that we got when that first happened that's what that's it's the part that different. that blew my mind was how different it was from what i had thought like i remember i remember that i remember when that was all happening and because I'm the way I'm getting my information is through the news. Yeah, I just chalked it up as this fucking crazy cult guy got a got convinced all these people to do a mass suicide. Well, like, yeah, that was in the time of a lot of these cults with the you know the mass suicide, like the Heaven's Gate and like uh, Jim Jones. Yeah, Jim that. Jones, and where everybody like took uh, cyanide or poison or whatever all together as a group, and they all died. And then you see this, and I remember. The only, I, I remember seeing the news and I saw the tank just like mowing through this building and then just this fire everywhere. And I, that's literally like all I got, you know, in terms of like my knowledge of Waco. So this was like, holy shit. Like I was like, man, I was like bummed out. Oh, it's a crazy situation because, you know, when you watch the beginning, how they, the, the agents shoot the dog, which then, you know, the other agents hear the gunshot. So right. they start firing in the house. So it becomes a war after he that. gets shot. He, you know, uh, you know, David Koresh goes inside the house and then his guys, they're all armed, start firing back. Yeah. What do you do at that point? Do you fire back? Even if it is the, you know, law enforcement, but they're shooting at you, even though, you know, and, there, and there's right. no cause. Like, it's a crazy, what a crazy, I'm watching the whole thing and I'm just so like, what the fuck? I can't believe this actually yeah, happened. It was a quagmire. It's I don't an, know how. Yeah, it's absolutely insane. It's well, scary. it's also too, like, how do you watch that and not. And not support the Second Amendment, dude. Yeah. How how do you watch? How do you watch that and go? Because that I mean, you think that could happen to a, a, a lot of people in a lot of different situations, and especially now seeing the way it unfolded, I go like, man, wow, we we could actually get it that wrong where we send fucking military in and dude. and, and hold somebody. In. If you put me in a in a building, which by the way, too, I didn't realize how many of those were like that was his family. Mm -hmm. Like how many of those kids were like his kids and connected to him and related to him. You know, if I was in a building and I had that many of my family members and I don't give a fuck who it is that's shooting on me. Yeah. Like I'm fired. Well, you back. don't you don't know what's kidding I mean, me. You don't know what's going on and you're just trying to protect. There's been it's it is very, very crazy. I mean, the Second Amendment was specifically included to protect against uh, tyranny. And I definitely don't advocate, you know, uh, using violent force against anybody. But. What a crazy situation. And I'm, I'm not, you know, I don't want to come across like I'm defending the guy. I think he was uh, crazy. I think that it was kind of cultish. It was very manipulative. But I don't see, uh, there was no justifiable right to go in and kill a bunch of innocent, you know, people. Anyway, it's definitely one of the biggest black eyes on oh, yeah. uh, on the FBI uh, yeah, in history. It's ugly, ugliness. <laughs> but sure. it is hard to watch. Yeah. So anyway. anyway, dude, I got this, uh, I think Enzo's the one that sent it. Um, kind of blew me away. I want to read this to you guys real quick because 
it's a, it was a study from Harvard that uh, got published. So Harvard University uncovers a DNA switch that controls genes for whole body regeneration. Huh? So they have found this this switch in the DNA that acts like a power switch, which can turn your abilities to regenerate on or off. What, dude? So this the- is like Wolverine shit. Yeah. So theoretically, you know, if they figure out how this works or whatever, could they could they make you like a lizard? Yeah. Where you lose your, you know, you lose an arm or something like that, and then you yeah. just start, or like, what's his name, uh, Deadpool, where his, his, his little baby arm comes yeah. out. Or, what, how crazy is that, dude? Thank God for comics, right? Now we know what happens, yeah. if, when we fuck with this stuff. Who's the Who's the comic? Uh, oh, it was the Lizard? Uh, what's his name? Spider Man's villain, the Spider Man right. villain. Exactly. That's yeah, why we he saw that played out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I mean it's 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 an interesting one, right? Why is it turned off in humans to begin with, and why is it on in in, in other animals? Because we have an ability to regenerate, but just limited. Like if you obviously get a cut, it'll grow, it'll heal. But if you cut your finger off, it ain't coming back. Yeah. But some animals do have a crazy ability to regenerate. They're confident that they found that link? They think so. Dude. And this isn't just, I mean, this had to be multiple trials. And this is all through animal studies, I'm, I'm assuming. Yeah. they. I mean, I'm going to look and see. Um, well, I don't know. So, so check this out. Uh, they don't. They discovered in, 19, in the 1990s. Scientists had discovered that there's a type of jelly, jellyfish that switches back and forth from being a baby to an adult. So they call what? it the they call it the immortal jellyfish. How do we know that? Um, how do we test that? I don't know. I have no idea. I have no idea. Yeah, I don't, like how but, do you? But how there do you, are jellyfish. Even, there are you, jellyfish that do this, where they can basically, unless they get killed or they starve, can live forever essentially because they just keep regenerating back over and over again. Yeah, how Dude, wild is we that? We are going to be immortal. I, I, soon. I, I think that'll pose the some of the biggest challenges mankind has ever encountered. <laughs> yeah, that's, I don't think our that's psyche can handle that. Yeah, right. I don't. I don't know how to navigate through that. Would you not want to be immortal? What do you think? I, I, don't, I think it would. I be, would want to be. I don't know why. I find it fascinating when people would say no. Like, why wouldn't I? Why? Would, I, I think I would want to. Also, yeah. I think most people would want to. But I also. You'd be surprised. A lot of people say no, they don't. Well, I think it's because we inherently know that, or they um, hate their yes. life. Hu- look, hu- right. humans evolved with this kind of progression forever, right? Since the beginning, and imagine taking that away. Would that change, uh, you know, meaning, wisdom? Would that cause people to become depressed? And you know, well, yeah, when things are finite, it gives you like sort of a, a framework of like, well, if I'm going to work, it's going to be for this long, and if I have, if I'm going to get vested in this, it's going to be for this long. And that, now it's like open ended, like that's I don't even like our brains. I don't know. It'll take us a long time to wrap our head around. Do that. you think we would do more or less as a society? Uh, I think you would do less. Yeah, there'd be less of a hurry, right? There'd probably, be less of a, yeah. Totally. Like, you should be doing creative shit. Yeah, yes. if you knew you live forever and you could stay young yeah. forever, I'll get eh, to that. I'll have yeah. kids in a hundred years. Yeah. Or I'll, <laughs> I'll get to that. <laughs> I'm gonna later. party for a while. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You won't retire because that wouldn't make any sense. How can you retire? So you just have multiple careers. I still think retirement doesn't make sense. It's, yeah. I mean, I, I take that back. It makes sense if you if you did dedicate you know 40 years of your life doing something you hate. Right. And I would understand why you'd be done with it after forty years, but I think that that's that's I think we see I see examples, and I'm seeing more of it now because I have a lot of friends that their parents are now retiring. You know, our parents are at that are getting at that age. We're at that age now where mm-hmm. it's you know mm-hmm. our 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 parents are are starting to retire, and a lot of the friends that we hang out with. And you know, the most common thing I see right now is this depression that they go through where. They have lost their purpose. The kids are all their kids are married and have kids and their grandparents now and they've saved up. They've worked so hard, invested just right to where they have mathematically figured it out that they can now, you know, live the rest of their lives without having to really worry or stress about an income to, to, to get by. And then it's kind of like, okay, what next? Mm-hmm. You know, and everybody at first, you know, all of them at first would talk about, you know, can't wait to get there because they think of like, yeah, we're going to travel and I'm going to golf and I'm going to do all these things and it's like I'm fish and. Yeah, and, but then you're not needed. Well, and then you, you, well, you need struggle. And, like you're, yeah, well, like the job or whatever opportunity you find yourself in, it's like there's a need for you there. Well, you and know? then you, and then you do those things, right? Because maybe you, you maybe when you were in full work mode, you couldn't um, do 
12 fishing trips in a year and you couldn't do 15 golf courses in in three months time but then now that you have all this free time you do and then it's kind of like okay now what you're i've already did all that stuff that i i couldn't do now i can do it whenever i want now i'm kind of over it yeah well depression and uh death actually goes up um there's like a spike in it after people retire because they come home it's a dramatic spike i know Mm -hmm. it's a big because I think you need something to drive you, and there needs to be a little bit of a challenge and structure and a little bit of a struggle. Mm-hmm. So imagine being immortal. At some point, you have yeah, to imagine- the struggle? Yeah, at some point, you have to imagine you would get bored. At some point. I mean, I don't know how many years it would take, how many hundreds of years, but you may be like, okay, I've had a master's degree in all these different subjects. I've studied Buddhism. I've done this. I've done that. Like- I just bored. Like I want to go. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if that would happen. If you can regenerate, like that's like the struggle is going to be temporary. You know, it's like not anything you're doing isn't going to be as like crazy and demanding and long term as it is now. You know, if you if I could just know that like I'm going to destroy myself, but I can regenerate. Like I, I'm going to have a totally different mentality. That's a good question. I mean, I- imagine if you could totally fix any damage you did to your body. Yeah. So there were no physical uh, repercussions from anything you did, alcohol, drugs, you know, sex, motorcycle crash, whatever. How would people live? Yeah. How do you guys think they would live? Well, we push limits for sure. Yeah. Because, I mean, you still die. I would. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> people would want to find that threshold. You well, know? you know, like, where do I actually die? You want to know it's a good comparison to that? So, uh, and it's not nearly as uh, insane, but it, it for, the, for all of human history, Having sex came with the, whatever you want to call it, consequence or the result, potential result of getting pregnant and having a child, right? Having a baby. And then we invented birth control where all of a sudden for the first time you had kind of this long-term preventative and you could separate getting pregnant from sex. And that completely changed society, completely changed how we viewed sex. Mm -hmm. It led to the sexual revolution, free love People just like, yeah, we could just do, you know, kind of whatever we want. And now people are trying to have to kind of going back and trying to revisit some of the old wisdom that came from, you know, maybe watching who, you, you know, who you have sex with and being careful and all that stuff. But it's, it's posed some challenges. So having a life with no potential physical risk, that would be like times a trillion. I could only imagine right. the challenges. Who knows if it will good or bad? I'm not saying it'll be bad. I'm just saying it'll be different. You know what I'm saying? Totally. And I could just imagine people being like, pfft. Yeah. All right, let's just get let's just do all the drugs today. Let's see what happens. <laughs> did, you guys, did you guys do anything for uh, St. Patty's? Did no, you, did I mean you, I, I had some whiskey. I, I was gonna say I thought I saw you post like a, a beer thing. weren't you doing? Did you drink? Uh, well, I, I wore a shirt and I drank. What uh, do you mean you wore a shirt? Well, normally, <laughs> like, what do you that's do? All I did. <laughs> yeah. Just the shirt. It was a shirt. He was sitting on the couch. Like, he sat on the couch with green, the green was, shirt, no pants. Festive. <laughs> Yeah, you don't need pants on St. Patrick's Day. You no. just need a drink. Just sit with your yeah, yeah, your wang yeah. out. <laughs> no, I was like, I, I actually like to go out on St. Patrick's Day. Everybody's like friendly and having a good time. And yeah, I just, you know, I, I'm just not in that same kind of life like style anymore. Like, so I was just like hanging out and like, I was, I was like cheersing nobody, you know, just like putting it down the hatch. Sounds sad. <laughs> Damn, that, that did sound I just sad, picture you on the couch with the shirt on, <laughs> yeah. whiskey. Nobody's like, around, like singing like yeah. Irish like bar songs this all by for, myself. This is for you, Petty. Yeah, <laughs> hey, down the yeah. And we, then we went to, single tear. Yeah, no, we didn't. We didn't do. We, we went to Big Sur. We just drove up to Big Sur and Bixby Bridge up there, and very very scenic, uh, beautiful place. We got to um, Julie Pfeiffer Park. I think it is. I think that's the name of it. State Park over there in Big Sur. Yeah. And we drive up there. So beautiful. And it was there. closed. Oh, why? Right. So we go all the way over there. Is it just from the fires? I have a while no idea. Well, I think the, the storms, mm. right? Uh-huh. So it was all closed, but nobody gave a fuck. Hella people were jumping the jumping the little gate and, and walking through. So we're like, let's do it. So we're <laughs> walking through. And you could see areas where the You're storm must have washed things down and, and the bathroom, a tree fell in and it was smashed or whatever. And then two rain, and literally, I'm not even exaggerating, there's at least hundreds of people in this park. Nobody's listening. There's, there's 15 signs that say it's closed everywhere. Nobody cares. Everybody's in the park doing what they want. Two rangers come in and they're so flustered. I don't know how many signs, how many signs do we have to put up? It's closed. The place is closed. And I remember I was laughing so hard because I'm like, you can't do shit. There's too many of us. <laughs> 
<laughs> How are you going to hurt us all? At first, I got scared. Like, and oh, all you, get, you get bear spray. That's all they have, right? Yeah. No, no, he was carrying <laughs> a gun. Come on, guys. Come oh, did they give Rangers guns? This guy had a, he was carrying a piece. Uh, Ranger Rick gets guns. I yeah, didn't think hey. that. I thought you had to, I thought you just get bear spray. No, no, he had a gun. <laughs> but what's he, what are they going to do? There was everybody, you know what I mean? There's so many people. He's just like all flustered. How many signs do I got to yeah. put up? And I'm like, not enough. Like trying to scold everybody. Did he yeah, get everybody out of there, though? Did everybody leave? Yeah, everybody was just kind of like, okay, yeah, you know, moving right. real slow. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, nobody gave a shit. Yeah. I parked all in front right, of Smith. Smokey the bear. Yeah. yeah, I parked my car in front of the gate like an asshole and just walked. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, I love it when that happens. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? But anyway, uh, what'd you, did you do anything, Adam? I, I had my godson's uh, first birthday, so we were we were over in. I thought uh, you had a godson. Yeah, I didn't either until a, a few months ago. <laughs> How do yeah. you? What did you baptize him? Surprise! Uh, no, so my uh, actually uh, Janet and Justin asked uh, Katrina and I uh, officially like we got to go down and actually I guess there's paperwork and everything we got to do. So to, this Catholic? Are they Catholic? No, it's not even that. It's just they, it's it's not a matter of it being a religious thing. It's that mm-hmm. hey, if we die, we we've never we want to make sure that our kids taken care of. Are and, you doing? Yeah, that's yeah. funny because my other friend who's who's Catholic, I was like saying I took communion and all this. He's like, well, you're not even Catholic. I mean, like it's not just for Catholics, bro. Mm. Like, <laughs> yeah, we've we've uh, you know taken that to the other team. Yeah, mm-hmm. the the godson thing isn't a, a religious thing as much as it. Well, at least I, for a lot of people, I know it's not. It's it's just that hey, you know, you got to think about these things. You know, Katrina and I fly together. We do think like so. So do they. And so they're like, hey, if you know if anything ever would happen to us, um, we would like you and her to take care of uh, our son if you'd be willing to do that. Of course, man. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that was just like a month ago they, they, they did that. and we That's have, an honor. Yeah, no, it is, right? I think that's really cool. And I think that, uh, you know, I think that he would probably be that um, for me. And, I, uh, you know, I, we ha- I haven't thought about any of these things until just recently, right? So this type of stuff has become conversation. And, you know, of course, when you first start this, and this is what they said to me too, you know, we were like, you know, going down the line like family. Because a lot of people think family first, right? You would mm-hmm. think like keep it within the family, but you know they're like oh, I don't know my your brother my <laughs> sister your uh, this and they're kind of doing that yeah. stuff they're like honestly like I would I would way rather see my son with Adam and Katrina um, and that is a, a major honor I guess that's just a, a testament to our character and who we are is and, it do you have any other godchildren this no this, yeah this is first this oh, is good for you man. yeah it's first first one so I think that's really cool and I think I would do the same thing with him because I think we uh, a lot of our morals and our personality a lot alike and so when I think of like who I would want to raise my kid. My sister would probably be a, a, a close one too, because uh, she's a lot like me, and so and I love her husband. Like they, I could see her. We, we could have the mind pump, just you know, LLC be the god. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Something happens. Yeah, mind raised pump. by mind pump. Yeah. <laughs> one of us will come through. <laughs> no, always. <laughs> yeah. That's a big responsibility. It's a big honor um, in my family, in our culture, and then of course in our you know the Catholic religion. You're also supposed to be one of the spiritual leaders of that child, and then you you they have a, supposed to have a special connection to you. So like in our family, they say that the child takes after the the godparents. So whoever baptizes your kid, make sure that they you know somebody you want your kid to be like or whatever. And well, that's what I think of right when I think mm-hmm. of the godparents. Is like you know um, I have a lot of people that are friends or close family that I think uh, could do a hell of a job and, and and take care of my son. But I think of too like man if if um, if I'm gonna have a, my boy take after somebody else's traits other than myself, like who? That's kind of how I would mm-hmm. think about it. Like who? Who would I want to raise my kid and have the the, the moral compass that I have and the, the idea the ideas that I have? Mm-hmm. Like I think that this that Justin and and Janet are, are are similar as far as their views and personality, how they would raise their kid, how they interact with their kid, like. No, and he's such a cool. I mean, he's one years old right now, and they got these new. Um, they have these power wheels now, which out of the one year old you would think way too early, right? Because he can't push pedals or drive or that. But it's it's remote remote control for the parent. Oh my god, that's, <laughs> that's so, so great! Oh, it's bro, bro. It has a Bluetooth radio in it. I think it go hella fast. Yeah. No, it it yeah. goes it goes really fast, and it's it's a it looks like a full size normal power wheel with the Bluetooth radio in it now. Yeah. And he can move the steering wheel, honk the horn, but Justin controls it with the remote control. But he obviously thinks he's driving it, so it's hilarious. <laughs> oh dude. my god! Such That's a awesome. such a cool toy. That sounds that sounds like so much. 
I mean, I'm just thinking of all the shenanigans a dad would get into with his kid. Oh, totally. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm going to go over the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> he hands it over to you. His single friend, like, figures this out. He starts, like, ramming, you know. Like, oh, my goodness. Make him go over jumps and <laughs> shit. I don't want to, Dad. <laughs> Some hot girl over there is like, yeah, Oh, sorry. My son yeah. bumped into you. Oh, I'm sorry yeah. about that. So there must yeah. have been. I'm sorry. There must have been 30 kids, uh, you know, 20 something adults. I mean, they threw a big old. They had two of the jumpy houses on their front yard. And, uh, you know, I was doing. They did a pinata. And I was like doing the, the pinata thing, right? And, or I was in charge of the rope. You were doing the belay? The, is that what that's called? Yeah. <laughs> no. On belay, belay on. Yeah. 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 So I'm doing the rope thing, right? And afterward, and I, I must have been doing it for like 20 minutes. I'm going like, man, this li-, and the line of kids just can't continue to look like it grew. And afterwards, I look over at my boy. I'm like, hey, I don't recognize like half these fucking kids. Yeah. So the the party got so big and it was out in the front yard that it attracted like neighbor kids. Oh, that just came who just, in. It just came into the party. That's par- awesome. Yeah, and there were so many people that I didn't know and recognize there anyways. I don't know all of my buddy's friends and family that's connected to that's him. That's so typical to kids. They just <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, in? And they totally. just come in. Yeah. You know? <laughs> they hear <laughs> Uninvited. Right, they hear the parents like, okay, yeah. line up if you want to do the piano, line up. Uh, what, and they're young. What was the piñata in the shape of? Oh, so his whole th- his whole th- party was themed. Did you see my post? I, said, no. I was I wanted the boats and hose theme. Oh, and they got, sh- <laughs> and they got sh- shut down. No, so he's a big fisherman, right? So the whole theme was fish, and so the the pinata were fish. They had uh, like real tackle boxes that you opened up, and they were all candies of look like fishing oh, awesome. lures and stuff. Yeah, it was really great. It was it was. I wonder how Peta. I wonder if Peta gets mad that people hit like a fake animal yeah Dude, I, I bet you nobody's bet you mad about fish uh, yeah nobody Those cares poor about bastards yeah, yeah. They, no, nobody cares about they're fish. not furry enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah they don't smile so anyway you know what i want to do real quick um is i wanted to you know that study that came out last week that t- that talked about how they, they correlated eggs eating eggs to a higher risk of death they did that big yeah, yeah. bullshit survey stuff, so whatever that i was talking about yeah so i wanted to call max lugavir and ask him his opinion because he's he's always real real well read on this kind oh, of stuff. Oh yeah, hell so yeah. So what, what do you guys think? I do, think that's awesome. Do you know if he's up and up on it yet? Yeah, you yeah. Well, him a text? let's let's see what he says. All right. Yeah. Hello. Oh ho, Maxie. What's going on? <laughs> Long time no speak, buddy. How you, how you doing, bro? I'm doing pretty good. It's great to hear you guys, your guys' voices on this Monday morning. Did, did, I, wait, did I wake you up, buddy? <laughs> yeah. You have a long St. Patrick's Day I weekend? I did sleep in a little bit today, but uh, no, you didn't wake me up. <laughs> okay, perfect. So uh, I wanted to ask you, because um, you're kind of the man with this kind of stuff, You know, we've been talking about this egg study that came out that showed an increase in, in risk of mortality if people consumed whole eggs versus people who didn't. It was supposed to be this big study or whatever. What are your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, it's the classic case of correlation not necessarily equaling causation, and yet the media has taken the study and ran with it. And when you look deeper into the study that was published in JAMA, the Journal of the American Medical Association, you can see that there are um, so many flaws to it. Well, I mean, not even necessarily flaws, but just indications that this is not something that should cause you to alter your diet in any way. So, I mean, for one, the study had one, it was based on one food questionnaire given at enrollment, the time of enrollment in the study. Oh, geez. So, I mean, wow. Yeah. I mean, so that's basically like asking you about your dietary pattern. And then the follow up, the average time of follow up was 17 and a half years later. So basically, it's like, think about how many times your diet is going to change over 17 years, right? And then trying to tether that to your health outcome. It just doesn't make any sense from a, you know, from a plausibility standpoint. So what you're, um, so what you're saying is that they, they, they got the group of people, they asked them about their diet, like how many eggs a day do you probably eat? And, people, and a bunch of other questions. And a bunch of other questions. And then... 17 years later, they follow up on them and say, hey, what, did you continue eating that? Is, I mean, I don't understand what the follow-up question looks like. Is it the same questionnaire? No, they didn't give a follow-up questionnaire. They they basically related the answers that they received on that questionnaire with how their health did 17 and a half years later. So they looked at the number of people <laughs> that had heart attacks, and they basically related that to the amount of eggs that they consumed 17 years prior, and they use the number of eggs that they ate on average to come up with a, uh, a 
you know, a cholesterol score. Now, what, what is your theory on why, why? Why do a study like this? Why are we trying to demonize uh, egg yolks? I don't understand. Like, what, what, what's your theory behind that? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm not sure. It's uh, the the whole thing about dietary cholesterol and how it affects our blood cholesterol and more importantly, our risk for heart disease. Um, it's it's complicated, but I mean, the truth is that for the vast majority of people, dietary cholesterol has no impact on blood cholesterol. I mean, if you think about the fact that your liver produces four egg yolks worth of cholesterol every single day, then, you know, if you're eating two, three eggs every day, you're, it's it's all that's going to do is going to tell your liver to produce less cholesterol because we actually need cholesterol. It's a, it's, it's a vital nutrient for life. Um, and the other danger with these kinds of studies is that eggs like meat are consumed in a way in this country that um, really ranges. I mean, it's a huge continuum. I mean, you, when you talk about eggs, like are we are we measuring the amount of vegetable scrambles that people eat with extra virgin olive oil or are we looking are we measuring is that a a, a surrogate marker for the amount of bacon egg and cheese croissant witches that Americans are eating you know? <laughs> now that's delicious that's a great that's an that's a, a fantastic point um that you're making there and the other thing too that I was thinking too max is for the last 30 years we've been it's been hammered into our heads that you know, eating whole eggs is bad for you. So you automatically kind of have a bias because for the last 30 years, the people that eat the most eggs are also the people that might disregard their health in other areas. Yeah. I mean, it's the same with, you know, people in this country that eat more meat also tend to smoke. Um, and we know that the meat consumed in this, in this country is of very poor quality from animals that are essentially tortured in the industrial farming complex. Um, and eggs are kind of no different. I mean, you know, they're consumed in a myriad of different ways, and it's they're most frequently associated, I think, with uh, you know, egg and cheese sandwiches and the like. So, mm. this study, I really would not, um, you know, it, these study uh, scientists know that these studies are are meant to basically stoke further research, but the problem is that media tends to take these sensational headlines and um, run with them and use scare tactics that uh, basically cause anxiety in their reader bases because that's what gets a person to sustain attention. Mm. And, you know, having worked in media, I know that if it bleeds, it leads. And so you are always going to have media taking um, studies like this and using it to make you feel anxious about your dietary choices because that's just what keeps you around and keeps you clicking. And, you know, so, um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, if we look to more rigorous like trials that have been done, which are a lot different than uh, the association highlighted by this study, I mean, we've seen that egg consumption can actually improve markers tied to cardiovascular disease. Um, for example, eggs can raise HDL cholesterol. They can uh, change LDL cholesterol to like the large fluffy subtype, the pattern A subtype that is associated with protection against cardiovascular disease. Um so that's where really where trials come into play and come in handy because that's where you can really kind of get, you know, into things and and assess cause and effect. Well, I, I really appreciate you getting on the phone and answering this for us, uh, Max. You're kind of like our, uh, you know, our the, the guru on this kind of stuff. So we really appreciate it. My pleasure, you guys. Love talking to you. Thanks, man. Have a good day, brother. Thanks, buddy. This quaz brought to you by Organifi. For those days you fall short on getting your organic veggies or whole food nutrition, Organifi fills the gap with laboratory tested certified organic superfoods to help give your health and performance the added edge. Try Organifi totally risk free for 60 days by going to Organifi.com. That's O R G A N I F I.com. And use the coupon code MINDPUMP for 20% off at checkout. Our first question is from Steve Neal. Can you guys talk about the misconceptions some people have about there being a difference between men's and women's training and nutrition? My wife has been hearing that men's fitness advice doesn't apply to women. This this is just uh, mar- Bogus. this is just marketing, and and there are general differences between men and women in lots of different areas, but it all completely breaks down to the individual. And here's the other thing: men and women respond the same to exercise, so there are no men exercises and women exercises. There is no men's nutrition and women's nutrition, although there may be different needs. Nu- needs uh, but again, it's it's all down to the individual. This is 
a marketing strategy, and the reason why it exists is because it works. We're, we've been in a constant struggle for a while with people who want to market our fitness products because mm -hmm. they're like, hey, let's just say, let's do a MAPS program for women. And we're like, there is no MAPS program for women. It's, yeah. it's, a, ma it's, it's a workout everybody. for everybody. There is no difference, but they're like, you'll sell more if you do it for women. It's like, no, no, no. It's, it's, for, it's for everybody. So in this, you see this in everything, by the way. You go to the, the supplement store and they have creatine for women. I've seen that before. It's like, well, it's creatine. Pink and, and blue. And they change the color. And they change the well. The market, the marketing, marketing is very similar to politics, and the strategy is to divide and conquer. I mean, it's it's very very sim. It's very very similar to the way we we handle politics. There's it's really funny to me, and I I don't know if we're gonna win this battle ever, because it, it's obvious that men and women are different, you know. And when you talk about hormones and things that play a role with building muscle and mood and sleep and these it's it's pretty easy to make a case that there should be a difference between men and women on the way we exercise well, there's biological reasons why women will store you know more body fat and this is like for a reason you know and so it is it's tough because like you know there'll be frustration there if like the weight you know you see like your significant other maybe losing it like a little more like quickly and uh so there's there's that like you kind of notice things that are different along the process but in terms of like what actually works it's it's a very similar formula yeah. I, I also think there's something that, that people are always like wanting to reach for a reason why they they're not seeing results or they're not seeing change for for following a diet or a program and there's a lot to be said about how marketers find these these buzz terms or ways to make you feel like oh it's because I was following this thing that was for men and this is for me you know like oh this is something that I need to do like I knew there was a reason why I wasn't seeing results following what those guys were saying it's like I need what these girls are, are going to tell me what to do it's just I don't know. It's, well, you, you want it when you do when you. It's market, undermining. I feel like it's it's really. It is, and it and it it uh, promotes um, myths. There's yeah. a lot of myths in fitness, and yep. it and that's and that just pushes and promotes it. Um, you know, a long time ago, gyms were places where uh, men worked out. Uh, men wanted to lift weights and get stronger and, and train, and that's just that that was the society, that was culture. And then you know, gyms wanted to attract women, and so the way they did it is. They created separate areas within their facilities that were women only. It was one of the ways that they attracted women. And they came up with terms like toned and sculpt and shape um, because, you know, at that time we associated lifting weights with looking like a huge male bodybuilder. And so, you know, women were like, I don't want to do that. That's very masculine. And so they said, no, 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 don't worry about it. <clears throat> we have these female women's machines that are pink and you won't, you know, don't worry, don't lift like the guys. They're lifting heavy. What you should do is just lots and lots and lots of reps, and that'll just kind of burn the body fat off of areas of your body and make you feel, you know, toned or whatever. And it's all bullshit. We know this. It's all uh, if you want to tone your body, you lift heavy. Just like if you want to build your body, it's the same thing. Toning is, is building. Um, and so then later on, gyms, uh, you know, women got a little bit more comfortable with weights, and so they got rid of the women's only area. So now gyms, most gyms don't have a women's only area anymore. Now it's kind of like a big area. But there's still a lot of myths that 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 float around, like, you know, I don't want to lift weights because I don't want to look bulky, but I do want long, lean muscles. So what should I do? Yeah. Oh, don't worry, I have this program. It's for women only. And when it comes to marketing, a very effective way of selling a product is by talking to a person, yeah. by by putting them in a category and making them feel like you're speaking just to them. So like, I could make a program that uh, you know, here's a fitness program. And if I sell it generally, I might have more difficulty selling it than if I say, this program is designed for men over the age of 40, or this program is designed for women, you know, uh, who have children or something like that. Um, and, and people who are falling in that category, you know, look at this program and be like, this is the one for me. Mm -hmm. All the other programs are for all these other people, but this one says specifically it's for men over 40. Therefore, I'm going to, I'm going to do this one. Now, yeah, that's always going to exist. And, and, and. Marketing has gotten so much more sophisticated now to where we can see behind a lot of like, you know, more of the analytics in terms of, um, you know, where you live, like how old you are. Do you have kids? Do you not have kids? Like, like what kind of magazines do you read? Like, so 
like peering into a lot of information you're already receiving, if we can communicate in a way that sounds similar to what you are already sort of constructing in your own mind of how it goes, that's where they see opportunity to just present it like that to you. So it it could be like pure crap or it could be like us where we're trying to find, uh, you know, a way to present the information that sticks out where it like it resonates with you, but now you're exposed to like, you know, better quality information. Now, do you guys, there are certain things, don't you guys think though, that, that women tend like when you're talking about uh, fitness goals, like to get, you know, to let's just use the most common one when almost everybody wants to lose body fat, right? So lose body fat, get leaner. There are some common pitfalls and mistakes that men make. And there's common pitfalls and mistakes that I think women make. And so, there is a way, I think, to speak to men and women differently about exercise and nutrition. The irony is the stuff that I think that we talk about on this show, though, really applies to women because I, I, most of my career I trained women. Mm-hmm. I mean, 80 plus percent of my clientele were women. So when we talk about the things like the application of over intensity, uh, fasting correctly, you know, not feeding the body enough nutrient. Like when I think about those things, I'm really thinking about my female clients because it was very common that I, I would see this. I would see the or the high repetitions yeah, and not lifting just heavy. cardio is the answer for everything. So there's there. I think there is something that we can talk about that there are some common uh you know, mistakes that men make. And there's common mistakes that I think that, that women tend to make. And so I think you could speak to, to them differently about the, the common things, but in general, I think that it, it just look at the end of the day, you're a personal trainer, a client comes in, you ask them questions. The question on the questionnaire that means the least to you is, are you a male or female? That doesn't change anything. I'm going to ask you your fitness history, Mm -hmm. how long you've been working out. I'm going to do an assessment. I'm going to look at your posture. I'm going to look at what your goals are. How are you moving when you, then it doesn't matter. None of that matters because it's all down to the individual. And then the way I apply my exercise and training is based off of the individual has nothing to do whether or not you're a male or female. Now, are there different challenges? Yeah. I mean, if you're, especially if you have a baby and you're a woman, there's other, there's their pelvic floor muscles you need to strengthen. You know, there's TVA activation that we may need to work there's on. There's things you're going to say, though, that are going to spark or trigger the interest of a male and spark and trigger the interest of a female. Oh, yeah. If I talk about getting big arms, I'm probably going to talk to a male audience. Right. If I talk about, you know, building a rounder butt. Getting jacked. You know, more women are going to be into that. And I get that. But the way that you apply your exercise is isn't doesn't change. Well, yeah. And the... and. And the way that a and guy, the, the way that a girl gets around her butt is the same that a guy would get around her butt, or a bigger arm. Right. The or way whatever. that a, the way that a girl would speed up her metabolism is the same way that a male would speed up her yeah, metabolism. That's right. It's, it's no just the, the terminology that you use to connect more with the male or the female. Or, like I said, I think there's more. It's it's more likely if I'm sitting if I have to sit down with a male or a female. Uh, I'm sitting down with a female. It, it's more likely that she has neglected strength training. And probably over applied, you know, hypertrophy or endurance type training. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just statistically speaking, it, a majority because of, they've been told the yeah, other right. stuff for so long. Right. And so, the, and I think that's why it's hard. Like when you get a question like this, where you have someone that uh, you know, a husband and wife, and the wife is just like, "No, I, I need to listen to." these girls that are giving me advice or these women that are telling me these things. And I think that's because whoever's providing that information is doing a good job of connecting to her, whatever they're talking about. Like, Oh, she's like, Oh, that is me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that is me. I've done that. Totally oh, different descriptors, you know, things like it, it's all about the language. I mean, but if you want to get down to like what actually works, it's very similar. The formula is there for both. Like it, it works for both people. Yeah. So like, for example, if I sold a fat, burning pill and I said burns body fat right I'm gonna get so much attention more effective way to sell a pill would be like burns belly fat all of a sudden I'm gonna get way more attention because people who are really sick of their belly fat right like I want that pill because it works on the pain points right exactly what was it we were at a, a restaurant not that long ago and they were selling something on on TV and I don't remember what it was and I remember thinking it was absolutely brilliant do you guys remember and I'm like oh they're taking an old product and now they're changing the focus now making it. Do you guys remember what that was? I don't, mm-hmm. but I know the what's the there's biotin I see or no biofreeze right now is a, one that's like a rebrand of something that's been around forever that you see coming around. 
Um, we're seeing the just the old school like icy hot type of uh, creams and things like that that have been around. I thought forever. you were talking about cool sculpting for a minute. No, no. You guys, are you familiar with Biofreeze? Yeah, I know what that is. Yeah, that's been around forever and it's being rebranded, remarketed. I think that's the biggest challenge that we have had on this show and yeah. and in building this company. I mean, we we have this. In, internal struggle that a lot of people don't know about that if you listen to mind pump like okay no big deal it's easy to communicate to you guys in a long form right to explain but do that in an ad yeah do that in an ad and attract somebody who's never heard of mind pump or any of us guys like man it's really really tough and you know it's it's tough because one we want to keep our integrity uh, and that's very important to us. But two, we also want to grow this business and reach people that we're not reaching. And if you don't know that you don't know, it's really tough to grab that person. Mm-hmm. And if you were to grab 10 random people off the street that don't know any better, I would I would argue that nine out of 10 of them would say that, you know, exercise and nutrition is different for a woman than it is for a man. Mm-hmm. And so that's the fact of the matter is like how challenging that is for us. And I get so I get the pain that this person is going through trying we, to convince them. Yeah, that. and we need to be clear: there are general differences. Women have general uh, nutrient, you know, uh, differences in terms of nutrient requirements. Generally, they're smaller, so they may need less calories, less proteins. They may respond a little bit more harshly to fasting than men do. Um, uh, you know, men may need more zinc, for example, a mineral that that you know t- tends to be needs to be a little higher in men. But at the end of the day, it's, it goes down to the individual. If I'm looking at somebody and I'm assessing the nutrition and workout, I don't give a, it doesn't matter what, what the general, you know, what, whatever your gender is and whatever the general advice is for that. It doesn't matter. It comes down to the individual. Mm-hmm. And when it comes to exercise, the rules apply. And, and the rules are if you want to build muscle and strength, you got to apply heavy enough resistance and you got to train a particular way. The exercises that are the most effective ones for most people are the most effective ones for most people, regardless of of gender. And those rules all those rules rules all apply. I'll tell you this much right now. I can tell you with pretty pretty good certainty that if a workout says for women, it's probably crap. I'm going to yeah. put that out there right now, 100. percent Like if if I you send me all the workouts that say for women, and I can almost always guarantee that that workout is a shitty workout and it's not as effective as one that would be made for everybody or whatever. All right. Next question is from Just Neil. What do you recommend when training your weaker side? Do you ever drop the weight or do fewer reps for your weaker side, or do you always train symmetrically? You know, um, I think it was you, Adam, that said this on an episode a while ago, and I thought it was brilliant. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but... Yeah, so it was probably me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, unilateral training is always real good if you have a weaker side, if it's significantly weaker. Um, so, you know, one leg at a time, one arm at a time, dumbbells, you know, versus barbells. But something Adam said a while ago, which I thought was real smart, was do your first set with the weaker side and then do and then match it with your stronger side. Yeah. So rather than constantly keeping the difference, uh, you know, let's say I can do three more reps with my right arm than I can with my left. And trying to make my left do the three more reps that it can't do because my right can do it. Rather than doing that, do my left first, do as many as I can. And even if I feel like I can do more with my right, stop right there. Right. Yeah. Because the the only way you're gonna catch up is if you if you let if you slow down the progress of one side and speed up the progress of the other. It won't they will never become even if you just progress them both. You'll always be ahead by three reps or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know? And you'll you, it'll balance out um relatively quick if you do a good job of this uh i i definitely i had this with my chest then i had it with my arms um both uh i had one significantly stronger more developed on one side than the other and this is exactly what kind of balanced that all out was i just started doing a lot of unilateral training and i always started with the weaker uh less dominant side and i would take it right to where form broke down to, like you said, don't try and squeeze out three more or push it to where your form is shitty. I take it with, I, I stick with perfect form and the minute I start to fail or I start to deviate the perfect form, I stop right there. And even if it was like a a, a quarter rep, right? Like I, I did nine and one quarter, I couldn't even get a half of a, a rep. Then when I do the dominant side, I do nine and a quarter. Like I literally stop copy it. Copy it. Yeah, I copy it. I literally mirror it. Even if it feels like I can do three, four more reps. And if you if you stick with that and you're consistent with that for a while, 
you'll you'll see it start to catch up. And the reason why the unilateral training is so important is because it's hard for us to see this, but like, and we're just going to use biceps since we're talking about them. Is if if you don't do the unilateral training and you go to do a straight bar curl or a camber curl, sometimes you don't realize it, but the dominant side is is taking more of more of the load. And so if you're constantly doing machine exercises and doing things with both your arms together or straight bar exercises where you're doing both arms together, mm-hmm. what ends up happening is you don't even realize it, but the more dominant side is is taking more of that load and you're not allowing to catch up. So and it'll just always stay ahead. Yeah. You'll never have that balance. Yeah. So that's that's been the answer for me and it's uh it's worked well with all of my clients and and it does like I said, if you if you're consistent with it for a few months um, unless you have some crazy dramatic discrepancy, yeah. but it's typically normally a couple reps different, which like, is normal. I mean, everybody's right or left-handed, right? So mm-hmm. you're going to be, and really the strength difference. And I want to be clear here for most people, not all people, but for most people, the strength difference isn't necessarily a difference in muscle. Yeah, it's more of a difference in skill. Yeah, well, so, there, and it's never going to be like completely balanced. Like, I mean, I think it's good to have that in mind of like trying to. Uh, you know, be able to lift a similar amount, but if just because of all the patterns that you're doing like consistently all day long, the priorities you have in terms of, you know, which arm or which leg that you're going to utilize uh, the most force with, um, you know, there's going to be a little bit of imbalances, but that's why it's good in the training process to address that. So to, to single it out with uh, unilateral training is is very essential, and this is why the you know the the argument of like whether or not it has value. Uh, I'm I'm all in on the unilateral, and then also you know the bilateral to to see how uh, you know that training has helped to kind of benefit mm. the whole. I don't know what old time boxer it was because this is reminding me of a, a story. It might have been Jack Dempsey, but I, I I might be wrong. But there was a boxer from from back then who was just a killer um, with his right hand and was doing well and knocking people out, but he never really became a champion. And then he broke his right hand or his right arm. Dude, is this Rocky Three? No. <laughs> no. <that's laughs> I remember. Oh, okay. Maybe. It's just the left rock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but that was based on that's based on a true story. Not that I'm Apollo. Not that literally, you know, what happened. But but right. this boxer broke his hand or his arm. And then continued training and just practiced with his left, and then became so good with his left hand yeah. that he became a champion. Because you know, being a southpaw really fucks people's. It's, uh, it's style interesting because I broke my arm, my right arm, twice in the same year when I was a kid, and learned uh, how to jerk off with the other hand. I just it was like natural. Like it, it was like a new friend that became an old friend. Yeah, you know? like it, it was great. Uh, but yeah, it was, I, I got really proficient with my left arm. Uh, and was actually started throwing and I, I could actually for a while there for a brief moment I was pitching left-handed and right-handed uh, in a season and did you know the thing is it wasn't like I mean I it, it kind of took a little bit off the performance overall like I used to be I could throw a lot harder with my right arm I noticed this it was like I could I could do a good job on both but it kind of dropped my right arm down a little bit it was mm. interesting yeah, I mean, there's a lot of theories as to why we evolved being one-handed, and one of them is that because we're such specialists, especially with throwing, that it can divert more brain energy to one side and make mm-hmm. you more more precise. But, I mean, you can get really good and really strong with the other side if you if you allow it to catch up, and you have to allow it to catch up. This was the, that's why I brought up what you said, Adam, because I think a lot of people are like, "Cool, unilateral training," but then they keep pushing right. the stronger arm like they always have. And so it's just always going to stay ahead. But you have to kind of let it trail back a little bit by matching the weaker arm. Yeah. And that's where you'll see the balance come Definitely. out. Next question is from Team Pasic. Once you've met your muscle building goals, what should we do to maintain fitness without gaining more size? What is the rep range that we should stay in while trying to maintain and burn calories but not build size? So they just want to maintain. What a great place to be. You know yeah. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Look in the mirror. I don't, I don't I'm I'm good. I don't want to change how I look. I just want to This is where you know oh, yeah. and this kind of takes me back to how I used to train where I could see some value in somebody who's not trying to make a lot of change doing a lot of creative workouts that are, you know, very random as far as the uh, how you train where I would come in and every workout would look different and I'm doing plyometric work in there. I'm doing strength stuff in there. I'm doing hypertrophy stuff in there. I'm doing, 
you know, balance stability shit. I'm doing all this crazy weird stuff just to challenge my body to to be able to be resilient to all these different ways of throwing exercises at it. I'm not really progressing very far uh, or changing my physique, but I'm I'm challenging it in different ways. I could see value in training that way. Like I could see like just purely out of uh, keeping your workouts fun and unique and different and sprinkling different stuff in it because you're not trying to gain more muscle right. or you're not trying to lose a bunch of body fat. Well, the muscles either build or shrink. So this is something that's a it's kind of a reality. They don't they don't maintain like they don't just stay the same. Now, when you do stay the same, what's happening is you're building and losing at an equal amount. So you're going through processes of building and losing and building and losing, and that just kind of keeps your body. Steady, and the reason why that's important to note is uh, if you if you if you start to train to maintain, sometimes you'll start to lose mm -hmm. uh, your 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 muscle as well. Um, now, I like what you said, Adam. I think changing your focus from how you look to just having fun. Just go to the gym and enjoy yourself. Right. Enjoy what you're doing. Stop taking the focus off your body. Now I'm just working out to enjoy my workouts mm -hmm. and be okay with losing a little bit of muscle and performance and then ratcheting it back up to build it back. And so the, what's probably going to happen is rather than just maintaining is you'll go through these little processes of you know, increasing a little muscle, decreasing a little muscle because now you're doing maybe more yoga or maybe less intensity. Oh, I want to build a little more muscle. Now I'm lifting heavier again. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going back down again. And you just kind of bounce up and down a little bit and change your focus. But have fun with your workouts. This is such a great place to be. And I, this is where I want everybody to be. I mm -hmm. always talk about getting to a place where you're working out for the sake of working out. You're yeah. not there to... to, to dramatically changed. Oh, that was a great moment. Like, uh, th and that's what got me into unconventional training. It was like, uh, I was at a time where, I mean, I had, I had, you know, like working out in the gym, I had that down. Like I had that down. I had, you know, barbell lifting down, like dumbbell lifting down. But then there was, you know, I, I saw people doing, you know, all these things with, you know, the Olympic rings with, uh, you know, kettlebells and mace bells and all these types of things. I just thought it was cool. And you're moving your body, you're challenging your body in other ways. So, uh, you know, yes, maintain uh, through my my regular type workouts, but I also was drawn to these new skills, and that was that was a great time where I just had fun with that shit and realized it was benefiting my body, and then bringing that back to my workouts, it's like wow, my shoulder is even more stable now. So, it, you know, there, there's just new skills, new attributes that you can kind of bring into the mix. Yeah, I think if you once you reach your destination which many people never do uh but if you've reached your the your aesthetic goals you've built the muscle you want to build like i i think my focus would become all about performance then you know like being able to utilize this all this muscle that i've built now like in different ways in explosive ways and endurance ways and you know, I would get create. This is where the creative workouts would come in, and, totally. and and I think it would be totally okay and fine to train this way. I don't think that is uh, the most methodical way to go after. You know, getting a specific goal. Like if someone came to say, "I want to uh, perform better," or "Hey, I want to uh, build more muscle," or "Hey, I want to burn fat," then you know, phasing your program out and structuring it in a certain way so you're seeing you know week over week change. I think there's a much better approach. But hey, if you're there, if you got to that place now, now my goal is enjoying my workout, mm -hmm. you know, and and learning to challenge my body and ex and finding ways to express. Uh, this newfound muscle or this new uh, pinnacle that I've reached with uh, the amount of muscle that I've reached or, or obtained. I've had a lot of members who are in this space of, of gyms I've managed where they just come in and they just enjoy their workouts. And a lot of them do a lot of outdoor stuff. That's what I notice. People who tend to be comfortable with oh, where they're at, yeah. they, they'll they come into the gym a couple days a week and then they'll be, oh, I do hikes the other days a week and I swim and I did some, you know, some indoor rock climbing and I did some cycling. These are people that are literally just, and I'll tell you what, these are the most consistent people you'll ever find. Mm -hmm. No joke, people who don't have an aesthetic goal, who just work out and they enjoy it, these are the people that tend to not stop working out. Yeah. They just love doing it. That's why they do it all the time. Now, you made a point, Sal, that I think it's important to reiterate is that you you are always kind of gaining or losing. And if you do reduce volume, there is a chance that you're going to see a little bit of muscle loss, right? It, it'll probably be so minimal if you're still training consistently the same, but if you are following a very structured program and you've scaled up mm -hmm. to a certain amount of volume and that's what got this physique that you now have, 
and you go away from that because now you want to enjoy hikes or you want to get into swimming or you want to try plyos in there or you want to just be creative and work out, it's pretty inevitable that you're probably going to not maintain that exact same physique. You might get other attributes that you may add, but you it's inevitable you'll probably lose a little bit. But at that point, if you're if you've reached your uh, where you want to be muscle wise, it's not going to be so much that it's going to bother you or you're going to lose it all. And gaining over it back is so easy. And yeah, exactly. And if you could gain it right back, but you know, and the, and the other option too is to continue training how you are right now. I mean, you could te- technically follow your favorite maps program and you could continue to go through. We've phased it all up. I mean, cause the big thing that you would want to be careful of, and I was just talking to my nephew about this the other day is, you know, I've just found out that he's been in maps phase one for like six months, you know, and <laughs> I like it's it. a fun one. Right. And I and I was explaining what why it was so fun for him. You know, great point. Uh, he has never trained, you know, doubles, triples, five reps. Like he'd never really gone for strength training and he was just loving it. You know, mm-hmm. he's hitting PRs like every week. And but what I told him, I said, well, you know, now that I know you've been doing it for that long. Um, I'm sure you, one, are starting to plateau quite a bit. Two, you're probably also starting to uh, encounter some achiness. He's like, yeah, I know my knee here and this and that. I'm like, yeah, dude, you've just, you've been in that for too long. You need to walk through the other, go through the other phases. So if you're somebody who uh, follows the MAPS programs and you, and you love one in particular, whether it be performance or strong or black or, I mean, they're designed to where you could just keep rotating through them and you should maintain pretty good health and your you should be your joints shouldn't bother you um and there's nothing wrong with with doing that especially if you've attained the physique that you want next question is from misfit nerdy what are the most important things to keep in mind as an online trainer this is getting um a lot of questions now on becoming an online coach well i think it's a growing field yeah i also think we probably struck a nerve a little bit last week was it last week when we we talked Uh, about this i think it's because we said the unqualified uh people getting into the space it's it's interesting yeah and how we think it's probably smart for most people to train people in person for i a while. stand by that 100 i don't even mm. think it's smart i think it's necessary mm. i think it's irresponsible of us to become an online coach i mean not. there's always exceptions right but there's, you're right there is exception there's exceptions to rules in everything that we right. do right but for the vast majority of people i think it's very irresponsible to online coach somebody because then at this point your only real experience of helping somebody get in shape is yourself mm-hmm. uh, and then you're going to go from that to coaching people virtually which is already an extreme challenge in comparison to uh, coaching somebody in person I mean coaching someone in person is challenging I mean it's I spent most of my career being terrible at it just to get pretty good at it right and to try and skip that whole process and go right into telling people uh, what they should do via email or DM or text message. Like yeah. it's like it's like reading the cliff notes to some massively long you know journal mm-hmm. and versus somebody else who's gone gone through every single page of that like knows it like and memorized. not not just that they've gone through every single page and then they've taken that information and they've applied it and yeah. then they've applied it and totally. then they've measured it right that's that's the part you can't. Uh, you can't read. You have to go and you have to do that and, and, and see that. So, well, I mean, and to be honest, like this job or like being a trainer is, is really being a problem solver and, be, and and knowing things and predicting things before they occur. And just because of like, you have to understand patterns and uh, you don't understand patterns until you literally like immerse yourself in it and go through each one of these uh, individuals that present you with so many different variables that throw you off. You get frustrated, but you know what? You learn every time like, oh, wow, okay, I didn't even consider Mm -hmm. that this might have been a potential issue, you know, like with uh, somebody who's coming in and they can't even, they can't even like sit up properly. So what do I do with this? I think that's, to me, answering like, okay, what's the most important thing to keep in mind as an online trainer? Well, the most important thing to keep in mind is that every single person you're going to talk to is going to be completely different. Yeah. And just because you've helped, you know, some girl that is 5'4 and, you know, works out four days a week and she loses body fat and loses weight on, you know, 1,600 calories does not mean that the exact same body type, same age girl who trains the same amount is going to be the same. 
There's no carbon copy. No, and that and that's the part where we can get really in trouble with with coaching people online is assuming that oh yeah I've I've trained I've trained this person before I've trained this type of a person before or this goal or yeah exactly the because the goal looks the same or because the the it's the, the same sex the same age the same weight means that the the same rules are going to apply like no it's that's that's the that's the hardest part is recognizing that you still have to go through and do all the the dirty work and really figure out this person individually and so the most important thing for me is the tracking process that they have to go through for me then to why and this is why I make wait in the morning, wait in the evening, wait, weigh your water out and track mm-hmm. all your food, track all your steps, consistently do that for weeks. And then I, and I'm, I'm, I'm paying attention to, that to, to learn this person. And I used to say this when coaching somebody online, I would never coach anybody for less than a minimum of three months. And it was because I said, man, the first six to eight weeks, you're just aggregating data. Yeah. I'm just learning who you are, you know, just because I've trained and, hundred- and three months is even short, right? It takes you like six that's, months to nine months. Right. To really- and that's why it's a minimum of that yeah. because the first month or two is literally just me figuring out exactly who this person is, exactly how they respond uh, when they eat a certain way, when they move a certain amount. So I can then take that information and come up with what I think is the best place for them to start mm-hmm. towards whatever their goal is. And again, like Sal said, just because somebody has the same goal, it doesn't mean that I'm going to take them in the same direction after that first month or two of learning about this no, person. No, I would say the, some other important things that you need to consider is what kind of an online trainer do you want to be? Do you want to be an online coach that just gives people macros um, and and workouts? Like, okay, here's your goal. All right, uh, how many calories are you eating now? Here's your macros. Here's your workouts. Mm-hmm. You're off on your own, which is fine. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is to be in daily contact with them. Hey, how you feeling? What's going on? How was your workout? Can you send me this video? Can you send me that video? Much more in depth. Uh, much more, you know, in contact uh, with the client. So determine what kind you're going to be and then communicate that to the people you're working with. Like, mm. I, I do some coaching now. I don't, I'm not nearly uh, as in contact with them as uh, my partner Jessica is. She's the one that does the day-to-day talking with them. I kind of evaluate and help them with their workouts. Um, and, and they know that. So you have to know what kind of coach you're going to be and then express that because I've seen people get in trouble by saying one thing and doing another or people expecting something and getting something different. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, those are the most important things. It's also, look, also understand this. You're only going to be able to coach the information that you get from the person. And when you're working with someone in person, it's much easier to get more information. If I'm training someone for an hour and we're face-to-face, it might take 40 minutes for the conversation to get to the point where I'm getting real good deep understanding understandings and, uh, oh, and information that there's person. so much body information that you acquire just by watching mm-hmm. uh, them go through this process versus them trying to describe it people are terrible at, at describing things to you about themselves oh, to begin with well, oh my god you'll ask people how's your sleep oh it's great and then you'll be co- you'll work with them and then you'll be they'll you'll find out that they wake up two or three times every night Dude, yeah. and you know it's like wait, I thought you They're said you had good sleep. Bags under their eyes. Yeah. Oh, I feel great. Yeah, no, no, I have good sleep. They have no idea. Um, so you can only good coach as good as your information. And so I would say, learn to ask a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. Learn to keep asking questions because you'll get information that the person doesn't even know that you need. Oh, mm-hmm. I, I think you have. It has to be mandatory that you make them track and log a lot of this stuff. And you know, I also used to make them send me videos every time like they're running through a maps anabolic program like i want to see their squat their deadlift their overhead right. press like i would make them video that to me and so then i could watch it so you've got to get all this data and information before you can even try and provide really good direction for them and even then that's challenging because mm-hmm. i'm not there when i'm there coaching somebody through a squat i can put hands on them mm-hmm. i can put hands on them and say no you need to feel this here or you need to pull this back here and i could like move them you know, try doing that without seeing them and then try doing that without even seeing a video. Like, huh? Like, that's not possible. Like, yeah. you're not going to, you can't quote coach a squat to somebody who you don't see the squat. So that's, I think that's another necessary evil here is or an important thing that this you need to get from these people is I want to see your major lifts on video so I can see wh- how you're moving. 
Um, I want to see all the information that I was talking about, nutrition, water, weight, because then I can start to kind of pick up on, okay, and steps. Okay, I can see what where your metabolism is at so that I know if I need to reverse diet oh, yeah. you, maintain, where we might be lacking nutrition-wise, fiber-wise. Like there's so many things that – I need to gather in order to even be a decent. I would trainer. love to tack onto that, like some kind of checklist of joints, like, you know, the, like have sort of a scale of like how they're feeling and like, you know, restrictions, like tightness, you know, pains, things like that. I'm always like asking about that within the workouts because mm-hmm. it's going to reveal a lot of information in terms of, you know, how I'm even programming the workouts going forward. Well, if you if you're an online trainer and you don't own Maps Prime and Prime Pro, shame on you right away. Because that, that I don't know how you could coach w- without no, tools like that unless dude, you make your own videos. This was, I mean, we all collectively understood that that was a massive, uh, you know, need out there because we'd get all these questions. Well, my wrist hurts when I do this, you know, my, my lower back is killing me for this. Like we needed to come up with something that was pretty simple and straightforward, but it w- had real answers for them so that they could go through it and like uh, be mm-hmm. able to kind of work on this. So yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is, that's a must. That's something that we put a lot of effort into to try and help simplify that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, again, uh, being an online coach is, it's a difficult, it's, it's difficult in different ways. Than training people in person, it's growing. It's a growing field, um, uh, and so you're going to get a lot of bad trainers. But if you, you got to decide what kind of coach are you going to be, one isn't necessarily better than the other. I think one's more valuable than the other. Might cost more. Are you going to be the one that just gives people instructions, or are you going to actually try to personal train them virtually? And if you are, you need lots of information. You need. I had a client a, a while ago where I always ask everybody, "Do you have any food intolerances that you know of?" Oh no, I'm fine. I can digest everything. And of course, later on, you know, oh, I get heartburn every night at 6 p.m. and I get bloating. Yeah. yeah. And so they don't know. They don't know to communicate to me that they have a food intolerance because they haven't made the connection. Mm-hmm. And so I have to ask all these questions to get those answers. Otherwise, you could, you know, oh, I have no no problems at all with my joints. And then later on, you find out that every night I have to sleep a particular way because my back hurts. Mm-hmm. And so if you, you wouldn't know if you don't ask those questions. Well, this is why too, I just, this is not a very scalable business. Um, not the way you really want to coach. No, right? I, when I was doing this and that's why when I was around about 20 clients, it was really the most I could because most of these people. So I, when I was online coaching, I had more communication with my clients than I ever did with my clients that I saw in person. It was all day. Yeah, because I, I, I have to be constantly talking to them. They, they, I, and I would encourage you to say, hey, if you have a question and you don't understand something, you, it, text me or let me, if you feel weird, you know, text me. So then we can talk about what you're going through, what you just ate, what you feel, what you notice. Like, I need to know that stuff as you go through it so I can, I can better guess. Because at the end of the day, I'm guessing. I'm not there. I don't know for sure. I mean, so I, I, I don't know what's going to happen in this this space in the future I, I i'm trying to figure it out like is this going to be are we going to evolve to be you know all online training and very few people will ever train in person anymore i i don't know i don't uh, and uh, are we just going to figure out all these things and get are we going to evolve and get better at being these online coaches i see a huge miss right now I see a lot of people that get in shape, build a audience of people that are following them because they look good themselves. And from there, they they pivot into, I can be a health coach or an online fitness coach or mm-hmm. whatever name we want to call it. And now they're advising people virtually. And, I, and not that it can't be done. I mean, I, I've done it. I just think that it's much harder learning that way to be a good coach than to be actually seeing people in person. So it's going to be an interesting next five to ten years with the the exploding Instagram models and trainers on uh you know what are what's this going to turn out as far as uh, how are people are going to see results from from this I don't know if it'll last forever or not mm. and with that go to mindpumpfree.com and get our guides they're all absolutely free make sure you go check them out also you can find us all on social media we have our own pages our own individual pages on instagram so you can find justin at mind pump justin yeah you can find adam at mind pump adam and you can find my page at mind pump sal thank you for listening to mind pump if your goal is to build and shape your body dramatically improve your health and energy and maximize your overall performance 
check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump. <laughs>